Okay, great. I can see a few people have started to join. So welcome and thank you so much for coming. We're just going to wait a couple minutes um, to make sure that everyone's here um, and then we'll get started. Wonderful. Okay, I might get started. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I want to begin first by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. Um, they are the original storytellers of this country. And I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm currently on the lands of the Gadigal peoples. Um, and I welcome everybody to share um, whose country they're on in the chat, if you'd like to. So welcome and thank you so much for coming to our panel event, How to Make Transport Safer by Closing the Gender Data Gap with She's a Crowd. Um, and a big thank you, first of all, to Portable, who are our incredible partners for this event. We are really excited to discuss with you tonight how lived experience storytelling can be translated into data that can better support decision-making and help and, um, and address gender-based violence in cities and on transport. So I'm Zoe and I'm going to be moderating the panel today. I'm the founder and CEO of She's a Crowd. We use crowdsource data to make cities safe for women and address gender-based violence. So I started She's a Crowd in 2018 when I was working in gender advocacy and I noticed that there was a huge data gap. Decision makers who wanted to change things couldn't access the data that they needed to do that. Um, but I also noticed that women and gender diverse people in particular were taking to online spaces to report their experiences. And um, it frustrated me that these weren't able to be used as data um, to actually inform change. So She's a Crowd has built an anonymous storytelling platform on our website where anyone can share their experience, um, whether it happened on a train, while walking or at home. And uh, those stories are used as valuable data insights for decision makers. We're building a bridge between victim survivors and decision makers. And at the moment, we're actually campaigning to collect more stories about your experiences during transport journeys. Um, and that's what tonight is really all about. So um, to begin, I'm going to introduce our incredible panelists that I'm joined with um, tonight. So first up, we have Dr. Emma Falou. You can give a wave, Emma knows who you are. Um, Emma is the founder and executive director of the Equality Institute and she uses she, her pronouns. Um, she is a researcher, feminist activist and a leading expert on violence against women. She is the founder and executive director of the Equality Institute, a global feminist agency dedicated to the prevention of violence against women and girls. She's also the co-founder of Voice, a non-profit organization that works with women and girls in conflict and disaster settings all over the globe to amplify their solutions to violence in their own communities. She has experience working with the UN, the World Health Organization, and has a PhD from Melbourne University. Pretty impressive. Welcome, Emma, and thank you. Thanks, Emma. So yeah, no worries. So next up we have Jacob Thomas. They are an academic, a human rights advocate and an advisor to the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. They use they, them pronouns. Jacob Thomas is one of Australia's most prominent leaders in sexual orientation and gender identity. Jacob works at the Monash Warwick Alliance and guest lectures on LGBTQIA plus health and human rights. They are undertaking their PhD in public health and preventative medicine, exploring the power of LGBTQIA plus youth around the world. They're a multi-published researcher in fields such as sustainable development, out-of-home care and public health intervention modelling. They're currently an advisor to the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, the Pride Academy, the Bisexual Alliance of Victoria, and in their spare time, they are a performer, designer and sometimes drag artist. Welcome, Jacob. <laughs> Okay, next uh, we have Joanne. Joanne Osborne-Taylor is the lead design strategist at Portable and she uses she, her pronouns. She is a human-centered designer, leader and coach. She is passionate about designing for social good, especially to improve the lives of people who've been disadvantaged or made vulnerable. Jo has previously led a project for the Department of Premier and Cabinet following the Royal Commission into Family Violence. 
The project focused on the lived experience of victim survivors and included working with the Victim Survivors Advisory Council and Specialist Family Violence Services. Since then, she's worked across Portable's projects in the sector, including working with ABC International and Young Women um, in the Pacific on cyber safety, designing a gender equality reporting tool for the Office for Women and other projects with the likes of Domestic Violence Victoria, the Domestic Violence Resource Centre and Respect Victoria. Joanne also recently completed a Master's in Design Futures from RMIT. Welcome, Joanne. So uh, next we have Nicole Lee. She is an anti-violence campaigner and uses she, her pronouns. Hi, Nicole. Uh, so Nicole's a family and sex sexual violence survivor and a passionate advocate um, who's played a major role through her past appointment to Victoria's first Victim Survivors Advisory Council. Nicole, who also uses a wheelchair, focuses on family and sexual violence perpetrated against those who have a disability or who depend on carers or family members for support. After suffering a decade of abuse at the hands of her former husband, Nicole now uses her lived experience of family and sexual violence to speak out for those who don't yet have a voice. She is also a freelance writer. She's published articles for Courts Global, Victoria Women's Trust, Mamma Mia, New Matilda, Women's Agenda, and she's a regular on the drum, which is why she might look familiar to you. Um, Nicole has also previously collaborated with Portable on the co-design of your case, which is such an important online tool that supports victim survivors to navigate their the way through the court process um, as they seek a family violence intervention order. Welcome, Nicole. And so last and not, but not least, we have George. So George McUnroe is the CEO of Sheba and she uses she, her pronouns. Shiva is Australia's rideshare service for women. While trying to get safely, um, trying to get her four kids safely where they needed to go and support her family as a single mum, she came up with the, an idea for a business, ride sharing that allowed an all women fleet of drivers to earn income whenever it suited them and that provided worry-free transport for women and children. Now that she's turned her idea into a reality, she's added CEO to the list of roles on her resume, which include stand-up comedian, breakfast radio host, ABC producer, and more. So George started her career in comedy after becoming a Victorian finalist for Raw Comedy, and her debut one-women show for Melbourne International Comedy Festival won her Best Newcomer nomination. She has appeared on Spicks and Specs, Can of Worms, and is a regular co-host on The Circle. She previously hosted breakfast radio shows on Mix 101.1 and Triple M. Welcome, George. Thanks. And welcome to all of our panel. It's so great to have you all here. Um, just before we get started with the discussion, I just wanted to remind everybody here that you can use the chat to, um, to kind of share your opinions and thoughts. And you can also use She's a Crowd's online reporting platform at our website to share your experience of uh, on transport of sexual assault or harassment. Um, please do make sure you're respectful in the chat um, and listen with an open mind. So if you have any questions for the panelists, be sure to post these in the Q&A, not in the chat. So I'll be opening up questions to the audience in the final 30 minutes of this discussion, and I'll be looking to the Q&A um, for those questions. Audible will also be posting some resources in the chat um, for uh, helplines um, and uh, other resources in case this discussion does bring anything up for you. We are going to be discussing sexual assault and gender-based violence. Um, so I just wanted to give everyone a heads up about that. So we're here to discuss the gender data gap and how it specifically relates to transport and how we get from A to B. So to get us started, I might ask Emma, can you explain what is the gender data gap and why does it exist? Thanks, Zoe. Um, what an amazing panel. It was so great to hear those bios and um, yeah, really honoured to be in like, such brilliant company. Um, so basically the gender data gap, it's, it's the phenomenon whereby the vast majority of information that we've collected you know, globally here and in Australia, and we continue to collect, whether that's economic data or urban planning data or transport data or medical data, it's historically been collected on men and men's experiences, um, and even more so, obviously, cis white men. 
Um, and that means that decision making is really based on incomplete data and therefore it's inherently biased. Um, I don't know if you know, but like your phone is designed for the size of an average man. If you notice it feels too big, it certainly does in my hand because I'm very small. Um, voice recognition software also designed for men. There's so many examples. Um, and it's not just that, unfortunately, it's not just that kind of relying on that data that's based on cis male lifestyles and bodies. It's not just inconvenient, but it's actually quite dangerous and unsafe. So there's lots of examples where um, the gender data gap has contributed to really problematic outcomes. So in the transport sector, for example, um, there's data that shows that women wearing a seatbelt in a car accident um, 47% more likely to be seriously injured, 17% more likely to die in a car accident that compared with men, basically because historically crash test dummies were based on or designed based on the 50th percentile man. Um, and there's even examples, you know, like from Sweden with snow ploughing, which you think that's not gendered and it has nothing to do with transport, but actually it's got a lot to do with both. So they did a study where they, they found that they used to clear the snow on roads first before footpaths. And when they looked at the data, it actually showed that that practice was disproportionately disadvantaging women um, because they were more likely to walk over men who were more likely to drive. And so when they switched that out and they started clearing footpaths first, it actually significantly reduced pedestrian um, accidents. So, you know, there's really positive outcomes if we start to look at data um, through a gendered lens. And I, I mean, I think you sort of said, Zoe, why does that actually happen? Why is there this gender data gap? And I think it's, it's kind of sadly because we still live in a world where the kind of white cis male body is defined as the norm. Um, and decision makers don't really often represent the diverse lived experiences of people in our community. And so the transport sector, unfortunately, is um, that's the case too. And in fact, the transport sector is particularly male dominated. And so we know that there is a, is a huge data gap there that's, um, that's unfortunately contributing to very unsafe conditions for lots of people. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I can see lots of nods. I think that the snow clearing example is such an interesting one um, because it's it's almost like they didn't think of it and no one would have really thought of it unless you were someone, a woman potentially, who needed to use space in that way and actually travel around in that way. And so when we design for the neutral, we end up designing for the masculine. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's really, really interesting. I'm, I feel, I'm going to feel a little bit like an ABC producer on You Can't Ask That for a second. And I'm going to ask Jacob a question. I've had permission to ask this. Um, you present very much as a tall, white, masculine figure in public space. Um, to someone who doesn't know you, that might be what they see. Um, unless, of course, you're on your way to a drag performance, in which case you're a slightly uh, taller <laughs> white figure in stilettos. Um, so how do you do you find that gender expression um, impacts your safety while you're on transport or while you're traveling around? Yeah, um, absolutely. And thanks, to Zoe. Um, I mean, before continuing, I also just want to note that it is International Non-Binary Persons Week at the moment. And it was the International Day yesterday. Um, for those who don't know the history of it, it's literally smack bang between International Women's Day and International Men's Day. Uh, so you're welcome. Cute. <laughs> love that. Mm. Um, and I love covering a gender gap because I definitely don't have a thigh gap. So there we go. Cute. Stunning. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so humour. Thanks, Hannah Gadsby. Tension. But look, I think there is, um, it's a really, really interesting one. I mean, I, when I, teach my students um, their mind, they're no one else's. When I have students in my classes, <laughs> um, you know, I always try and get them to, you know, understand, you know, points of privilege and like, you know, what does relative privilege look like? What does assumed privilege look like? And also was just like a hard fact of your privilege, like whiteness, for example. Um, and so, you know, I always try and bring in my personal narrative into this uh, because, you know, stories are incredibly important. You know, plug for she's a crowd, fill out the surveys. But also, you know, it's to get people to understand that how you are perceived um, may not be how you relate to yourself. 
and you know rightly so you know I always give the example of you know I'm usually in um like a pair of jeans um like a flanny um I grew up in Shepparton on Yorta Yorta land so surprise um look great in a flannel cute <laughs> love a plaid but um you know and yeah like I've usually got facial hair um even when I'm in drag like you know it's just this is it um and like your yeah, boots on and so if you didn't know me and I have a stink face I have, I have one of the most flexible faces I can't hide what my opinion is all the time and I'm a trained diplomat like it's taken a lot of years of work <laughs> to try to make this happen but um if you just looked at me on the street like I would look like an aggressive like white dude bro um but then I love to give the example of like I talk and everyone's just like oh it's a queer it's fine <laughs> don't worry about it it's all good <laughs> like, <laughs> that's kind of it I'll like I'll start walking I'll just <laughs> I'll walk, like, like I'm very I'm very faggy and I'm very femme and it's just what it is but that in and I do I used to play that up quite a bit because I wanted to make sure that being you know six one broad you know built like a brick shit house that I don't come across as threatening or that people can calm down and that was from working in a lot of you know female dominated fields like education healthcare for example you know I was trying to be very conscious and cognizant of how you know these people who maybe I knew quite well or I didn't were you know navigating their own world and I was working that out before I actually realized I was non-binary so then coming into the larger discussion of like, you know, what does gender look like? You know, the performance of gender, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I also have to point out the fact that I dress like that for stealth Mm. because I don't want to get attacked. And, you know, there are numerous times where like, I'm a a designer as well. And like, I design really pretty stuff, but I rarely wear it out because um, fear and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, right back to, um, Emma's incredibly poignant points there is that it's just we live in a patriarchal world we live in a space which is just designed around you know cis white heteronormative you know patriarchal standards and the people that benefit from that so yeah gender absolutely plays a humongous role in our safety I think we're just uncomfortable talking about it because when you you know disrupt and you discover science and you discover data um because, you know, it's not stuff that we've just created, just like, you know, being non-binary. This has been with First Peoples for millennia. I'm, I haven't come up with it as, you know, a white person. <laughs> yeah, I didn't just wake up one day, just like, oh, that's it. Yeah, I like that. It's nice. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. It's, you know, there is so much to still be discovered. And when you bring that up, yeah, it makes people really, really uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about it or they feel very threatened by it and will lash out. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I feel a bit damned if you do, damned if you don't. But also, like, I'm in my 30s now, so I just tell, tell people to F off. Um, and that's actually quite delightful. But again, that is using an assumed privilege because I know that that looks threatening back to them. Mm-hmm. And that's it. So it's a constant struggle just to walk down and get a litre of milk. That's just it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to hear how you navigate this experience of understanding that you could be a potential perceived as a potential perpetrator um, to someone else and then also understanding for yourself that you're also a potential victim. Um, So thank you for for sharing. I also wanted to ask Nicole, how does the intersection of gender and ability um, affect people's access to transport? Well, of course, you've got all the really obvious things that it is, it's like the physical access to transport. But Um, When it comes to being a woman in a wheelchair out in public using transport, whether it's taxis, whether it's trains, trams, buses or whatever, buses are the most inaccessible things, I avoid them completely. Um, It's it's this, I, I, I feel very vulnerable and I feel like I'm in incredibly vulnerable situations and I do feel intimidated and just like some of the things that Jacob just said there is that sometimes I'll put on a very steely face so that I look a little bit more intimidating. I'm a little bit more scary. I'm less approachable um, to complete strangers. But, you know, I can't run away from someone. I can't just dive out of a train if somebody's, you know, uh, if there's something going on, on, on in the train. And, you know, it's, and, and I've heard from other disabled women where 
um, when they go out that they will deliberately wear more masculine clothes, you know, wear like a leather jacket or a denim jacket and, 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 and put the collar up and try and look more manly so that they don't become a target. And there's something about being a woman in spaces where we become a little bit public property where they just, everybody wants to come and feel, they feel they have a right to come and talk to me. And, and I just want to be left alone. Um, and, and that's something about being, you know, being a woman and being, and, and I am in a wheelchair. So I've got that physical disability and people see that as non-threatening, but then they also see the need to come and ask me multiple questions about my life or uh, why am I in a wheelchair? And I used to find that stuff intimidating. And now as I'm getting older, um, I'm, I'm a bit like Jacob, whereas like, if you want to stare at me, good luck, enjoy it, sit there and be uncomfortable and confront why you're uncomfortable looking at a woman in a wheelchair out on her own, unassisted, without a carer. Um, don't come and talk to me. Don't talk to me to ease your discomfort. Go away and leave me alone and sit there and question why you're uncomfortable with this right now. But the other side of that, like we also use a lot of um, you know, taxis as well. And I can't speak for all people with disabilities, but for the experience of myself and other women in wheelchairs is once you're in that front seat or the back seat of a taxi, your wheelchair has physically been taken away from you. And you're, you're completely at the mercy of this person. They can drive wherever they want. You cannot jump out at a, at a set of traffic lights to run away from this taxi. My chair is in the boot. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a really you know, vulnerable feeling and, and it's not of our making we've been put in this position and people don't understand what that feels like. So having to always be on guard, I've got my phone on my lap, it's open, I'm chatting to people so the driver knows that if anything goes wrong, I'm going to let somebody know um, that something's gone wrong. Um, and, and I have had an incident where the driver was refusing to stop the car he was demanding my credit cards. And I just said, yeah, you need to stop and let me out. He refused to let me out to the point where I'm yelling at him and he's pulled over and I physically opened the door and I'm sitting and I sat on the ground. And the, the, and the, and the fear of that was he was going to take off with my wheelchair, which he didn't. He got it out of the boot and took off. But you, you, I can't run. And, and this is the reality we face. So, like, I avoid taxis and a lot of us do. Um, and... And, and the fear with using things like other ride shares like Uber is that they aren't regulated. They can take, you know, not choose to take our fare. Um, there's no cameras in there to prove what's going on. They don't feel safe. And then the other side of all of this, if I just, you know, use public transport because it feels slightly safer, we do not have point to point transport. So there's all of that infrastructure in around a train station. Not every train station is accessible. I don't know how many times I've, I've gone down one of those ridiculous ramps and, and, and flipped my chair and hurt myself. But, you know, if you're going somewhere late at night, you've got to go from the public transport to a venue. And then all of the things we're told as women navigating this world is that for a lot of the times, I don't know how many times I've had to go to a restaurant. I think it's at the, the comedy lounge is one of them is, you know, women don't walk down a dark alleyway alone at night in, you know, in the dark um, you know wearing a short skirt so I've gone out on a date I'm wearing a short skirt I've got to go down a dark alleyway past the rubbish bins in the dark on my own and all of the cardinal sins that society tells us we should not do we have to do a lot of that um, and we have a little joke we call it murder alley but I can tell you right now they're not fun experiences and 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 you know traveling around the city and and having that right to feel safe we don't have that yet. And it's conceptualizing what does the whole journey look like from start to finish? And until we have point to point infrastructure, that's, you know, it's, it's constantly something you have to weigh up um, going out, you know, do I hire a support worker just so I feel that little bit safe navigating all of this stuff, even though I may not necessarily physically need them to help me navigate this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you bring up the end-to-end -end journey and um, another term for this is kind of the whole of journey approach, um, which is so important when we're looking at transport um, and solutions um, for, the, for these issues. I have just seen George just absolutely mortified to hear Nick's story. So, George, do you want to um, well, look, tell us? It just does my head in. So I, I know it didn't come up in my introduction, but like the first six years of 
my working life was actually spent working um, as a carer in disabilities and um, some of the young men I worked with had um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and they had big heavy electric wheelchairs you know up to 130 kilos and they would try and get in on the train and you know sometimes their batteries would be flat but they couldn't just bridge that tiny little bit of um, yeah. the gap between the platform and the train and they would miss job interviews or you know some just events but they weren't they were scared because of a, you know just I was aware of their vulnerability as their carer and I was very anxious for them um, because they'd come home you know really upset and mm. distracted and you know because public transport clearly did not have any design you know we we have Compared to, say, the United States, I was very good friends with Stella Young, bless her soul. Yeah. Um, and when she went to America, she couldn't believe when she came back, she kept thanking people for having a public toilet that was accessible for people in mm. electric wheelchairs. And um, they kept saying, you know, ma'am, it's your right, you know. And she was like, oh, God, you know, I've never fancied that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so that's one side, just the whole accessibility feature and, design with people you know in mind all of people who are entitled to safely have access to the cities that we build mm. for all the people um which are it's so behind in australia it's embarrassing mm. that we don't have lifts in our schools we don't have you know toilets large enough um you know, we still don't have ramps that work you know they come down to this hard point and as nicole said people flip out of their wheelchairs um you know it, it's shameful but the point on you know in queensland it, it's illegal for uber drivers now and as women at sheba to for us to put cameras in cars so our drivers are fined for having a gopro in their cars um they face a big penalty unless we include a cctv 24-hour you know, two thousand dollar ridiculous piece of equipment into a family vehicle, mm. bolted in, ruin the Duco. Um, yeah. It's illegal for us. So all the women who drive on our platform, who might also drive on Uber or Didi or Ola, you know, they have some of them have left the industry because they would they were frightened. They wanted to be able to have yeah. the cheap GoPro in their car, but the taxi lobby sufficiently argued that no no if you're going to be in the industry you have to have one of these like we have as cabs in the northern territory they have cameras in the cars but they don't have the sound turned on so mm. there is no evidence if anybody fails to give consent um you know they have this what they call the cabbie's defense so if somebody is sexually assaulted in the back of a cab um who mm. is has drunk too much alcohol, is sexually assaulted. There's no evidence of somebody saying, mm. no, 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 get off me. There's just, you know, a man lying on top of a woman who's inebriated, who later goes to prosecute, and the prosecution has to throw it out for lack of evidence. Um, in terms of data collection on these things, when I went to get our exemptions under the law, we couldn't find the data. We could find in New South Wales, it was very interesting, that there were many, many more complaints, like 75% more complaints made by women than men. But at no time would the Australian Taxi Industry Association confirm the basis or the nature of those complaints. So we, the Attorney General kept throwing it out, saying that no, you're not going to get your exemption, you're not going to get your exemption. Um, we can't, so, so I've got Queensland data, I've got Victorian data, and they're saying, no, that we, how could we possibly say that that's the same thing is happening in New South Wales. It's like, well, how could you say it's not? Like the taxis still have four tyres, five doors, you know, five seats, four doors. No, 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 we can't possibly. Finally, I found that there was a men's piccolo group, I'm not joking, that had been granted an exemption to play their piccolos in peace. The Freudian analogy, it just, it doesn't even... Anyway, they were free to play their piccolos in a little group without fear or, um, of women mocking them and their, the size of their piccolos. Um, and they, they got an exemption to play without women. And I wrote this very scathing, sarcastic, vitriolic 
real piss take of a letter and we we got the exemption to operate a, a single sex service mm -hmm. um and i thought no there's no way that anyway i got it and finally mm -hmm. but it took 10 months mm -hmm. to be able to say women should be entitled and i had little scraps of data from news articles like there were 19 sexual assaults on sydney buses um sydney trains every month mm -hmm. um to the point where they were going to start this pink carriage service and alan jones of course threw a tantrum and it was everyone was up in arms about it and we're not some third world country where it's like well we yeah, kind of are like it's pretty hard to get a rape conviction in this country and it's mm. pretty hard to get it to is her and yeah uh, yeah and, and the other parts of like what you're just saying there is is the fact that the ndis has no gendered lens and the fact that we don't have as many women in the ndis but you know we do get funding for transport but there's no understanding of a gendered element of taking a support worker for safety reasons or you know mm -hmm. maybe choosing Sheba versus a um, registered taxi and and there's no understanding of that within our NDIS which is also a major failing around transport for you know for disabled women too. Well that's right and we tried to get access to the MPT P cards and we we couldn't get it they were like so we had a number of women saying to us uh, especially women mm -hmm. with you know visual impairments who are saying you know yep. we I will not complain to the taxi about this taxi driver because he could sit outside my car, my house, in his car, and I will live in terror that he is going to come and assault me. And I feel so vulnerable. Um, if I register a complaint, I will be a sitting duck. And so I won't do it. Um, I'll just take my chances. And some of them will just pay out of pocket for the security or their family will chip in. Um, and a lot of parents, <clears throat> sorry, of, of women with a disability or, or a young man, even with disability, and she will make an exception for uh, vulnerable, you know, young men to say, look, you know, he's terrified. He's had it. He's been sexually assaulted in the past, and you know, we will find a part, a driver partner for him, knowing that that's the parents are so anxious about that happening again because of the lack of reporting, mm -hmm. of the lack of data, of the lack of hope that there will be a successful prosecution and the lack of evidence. Yep. So George, this idea of female only transport is hotly mm -hmm. tested um, and you've alluded to that there as well. So what do you think the value of all women transport is and is this our future? Well, look, I think, you know, we, we just looked, I looked at data, right? So women of course do commit crimes i'm not going to say that they're particularly we particularly hold our own in fraud um go sisters um but women are less likely to be sexual predators they women are about 2.8 percent of sexual predators globally um but they occur we we do we have had um four women who failed to meet the working with children check that we insist on at, at sheba but you know, that's over five years. We've had four women who, we, that's another check that we do. Um, so that's, I'm glad that we have that balance, that check, those checks and balances. No other ride share company imposes those. But, you know, it, it's still, there's a less likelihood of sexual predation in the first instance. Um, and I think what we find is that, you know, when you look at the criminological, you know, tendencies, and I'm not saying it's impossible, but there just doesn't seem to be um, what they call, um, you know, momentary acts of sort of opportunistic offending. So, yes, there are women who have groomed school students and, and that sort of thing, which is still a crime and should be absolutely punished to the full extent of the law, but it is a different type of offending. And... Um, it does happen with less frequency and I don't begin to know why that is but I think most of us would say if our child was lost at the show go and find a, a family or go and find a, a woman with her children and say you're lost or find a police officer and say you're lost but we probably wouldn't say go and find a single dude and hold his hand and tell him that you're lost I'll just there is an innate sense that a woman will care for you. Mm. I don't know if that's just 
gender yeah. bias, but that's just, um, it has proven to feel safer and most of us, perhaps it is the checks and balances that we've also put in place on top of that. But yeah. we haven't had an incident, yeah. Mm. Um, Joanne, so she's a crowd. We've recently designed an interactive dashboard that allows decision makers to access data insights um, about the experiences of women and non-binary people in and around transport. So I, you're very passionate about uncovering new insights um, in order to redesign services. And um, how do you see gendered transport data could contribute to better design of transport services and cities? Well, I think, you know, inherently we want any data that's helping us to make a decision to represent the diversity of our community. And we've already heard lots of stories about people with very different experiences and different perspectives. And so when we think about something like transport, it's a population-wide uh, service that's being provided to, to everybody. That's what we want it to be provided for. Then we need to make sure when we're designing that service, we're designing it with the diversity of our community uh, in mind. Um, and inherently, you know, we've talked about the fact that a lot of services are designed from a very privileged uh, position. You know, if you are happy to walk down dark streets at night, if you're really comfortable to, to leave a meeting at work and walk out onto a street when there's not many eyes on the street, it's actually really hard for you to see a different perspective. And so we use qualitative methods like co-design to actually bring people from the community together to share all of the different experiences that they might have. And what that does is it helps decision makers then to stand in other people's shoes and to, st and to see transport settings and services from other people's perspectives. And it's really challenging that idea that when we're in an organisation, we are the experts in designing that service. Um, you are to some extent, but you're very limited. You have your blinkers on. People with lived experience who use your service can offer you um, a perspective that you actually can't you can't have from within, um, and they make visible what is invisible to the organisation. And so it's really important when we think about the stories that we hear that those stories um, you know are inclusive of everybody in our community because that way we can actually design better experiences for all. Mm. Yeah, storytelling um, is something that I want to talk about um, tonight. So um, I might start with Jacob. Have you shared a personal story of um, one an experience that you've had, a negative um, experience you've had um, while out and about traveling um, on social media um, or um, through another reporting platform? And what do you think is the role of storytelling in social change? Oh, um, <laughs> okay, double barrel me, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Get it. Zoe and I are friends, just so everyone's very, very clear. Um, although we'll see how I feel about that after this evening. <laughs> okay, cute. But um, no, I, look, I'm, I've um, <laughs> dealt with my fair share of um, very, very crappy incidences. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting is that I think, um, I mean, there was a really interesting one, <laughs> interesting one. There was a really shitty in incident <laughs> that I had um, in 2016 where I was, um, uh, I'd been on a date and it was really cute. Um, <laughs> there was no second date. <laughs> um, but <laughs> cute. Um, <laughs> I'm single if anyone's interested. I get while we're here, done. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you know, we, we kissed, I walked down toward, because it was Ligon Street and, uh, here in Melbourne. And I was just so like, eh, it's light, it's busy. I'm in an actual fedora <laughs> because it was expensive and I looked very cute. Um, and I was like, fuck it. Why not? I'm just going to walk down the street. It's going to be cute. And I got accosted in like the restaurant he hecticness by four big white dudes and I got called some of the worst things and I got pushed around and I had no intervention from anyone and it was packed it was absolutely packed like I got spat on it was just vile and that's not even the worst experience that I've ever had and it's not the oppression Olympics of how bad things can be um but in again like you know that's the whole that's me wearing a hat mm -hmm. nothing else no makeup no nails no heels nothing else <laughs> 
never buy shoes you can't run in um unfortunately and that's i can run in my stilettos so <laughs> we're ready <laughs> i love fear but you know yeah. it's um i just remember i was just in absolute shock um and i already have ptsd from other things um so i went straight in my brain went straight into coping and i walked from carlton all the way down to jollymont station in a haze just to get on the tram and just to go home and it didn't actually set in until afterwards when I actually saw a friend of mine on the tram and I got and he lived in Richmond at the time got off and I absolutely broke down and I was just so I was just absolutely shaken as one would be so it was interesting is that I was just like look I'm gonna check this up on social media I'm gonna put this on Facebook uh because fuck this <laughs> gonna let you know that this still happens because you know the narrative for us is queer people and again I can't speak for all queer people under the umbrella of course but you know it's like this is the year before the survey <laughs> this is the year that I was told I'd be getting a human rights award from Her Majesty the Queen this was a big glow up year for me in my career and still garbage still garbage still happens all the time Bad stuff happens to queers all the time. It's not about marriage equality is the be all and end all. I just want to make that very clear. Mm-hmm. I put it on Facebook and the number of people, people, very dear friends who are just like, you should report that to the police. So like, you know, um, making assumptions, horrific, gross, racist assumptions about these guys, you know, um, assumptions around their you know, cultural practices, around their religion and their faith. I was just sort of like, this is not the time. This is not it. Yeah. Could someone just check in and ask if I'm okay? That would be delightful because that's what I did this for. I'm, I, I made it very clear. I feel gross and I feel hurt. And my housemate wasn't home at the time. So I went home to an empty house yeah. and just felt so gross and so unsafe. And, you know, it's, and just the backlash. And it took about, it's not even an exaggeration, about two weeks of me having to manicure people through how do you ask and check in if supposed mate is okay? I found more solace on Twitter than I found in my curated Facebook friendships. <laughs> so it's just, what are we doing? And it's it's just so interesting to sort of, you know, that put me off for such a long time to sort of think about, well, I mean, none of you actually cared because mm-hmm. to care is an action and none of, none of these people showed action. I mean, a friend of mine, Hannah, was beautiful about it. She has went straight for the jugular on everyone. And she was just like, can we just appreciate for a second that Jacob is going through this garbage and they're still stepping up with kindness to tell you that you're shit. Just work that out. And I was like, oh, mwah, delicious. Yeah. Oh, yum, yum, yum. Gorgeous. So God, do reasons. You, think you raised some really interesting points and mm-hmm. um, it kind of brings up a question for me mm-hmm. about the nature of data. And I think that probably a few people on this panel um Emma I'm looking at you and you know um yeah I, I want to open up to everyone do you think data can be or do you think data is racist <laughs> homophobic transphobic ableist I can go first if you want to say it's definitely <laughs> racist <laughs> um yeah I mean I think it's all of those things for sure I mean we know um I mean I'll just go on the race side because it's what I know, um, but that, you know, data was used to basically in the development and justification of race science. So it was used to claim that there's an evolutionary bias, you know, basis for inequalities and in social outcomes. And it was used to justify slavery and discrimination and racist ideologies. It's, that's just the truth of how data has been used. So, um, I mean, data and, and science is a reflection of our cultures and and the social norms that exist within them. So to think that somehow data and science ex- exists outside of, you know, racism and sexism and homophobia is, to be frank, bullshit. Like, it just doesn't. Um, I mean, if you Google, I was playing around with this just yesterday, Google images like healthy skin and do you know what you see? All white people, white women. Even if you if you Google beautiful woman, do you know what you see? All white woman, women. Like, it, it's ridiculous, like, how... Um, how sort of skewed the data data science is and it's not just sort of ai and and in that sort of sense of data but we even know data science from the like 
you know, the high end kind of academic science side of things is incredibly skewed as well. So we know, for example, that ethnic minority individuals are excluded from scientific institutions or their contributions are recognised less or um, they're very rarely rec um, sort of reflected in technology and data science. We know that black scientists are less likely to receive research and innovation funding. We know that health data science is, you know, skewed to a white Western lens. So it just goes on and on and on and it, and it happens at every level. It's from, you know, the way data is collected, the way it's analysed, the way it's presented. So it's just, um, and then it shows up obviously now particularly a lot in, in the way that data is used online um, for mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. Um, and so it's just becoming more and more embedded into the way that the world is skewed um, to kind of normalise whiteness. So that's my uh, rant over. <laughs> it institute your, um, your organisation has such a great Instagram page. We've been following it actually as a crowd for ages and we've always been huge fans of it. Everyone should go and follow them. Go follow us, thanks. <laughs> Thank um, you. I know that you use, like, the, the content that you create is very shareable, very informative. You use stories, you use statistics. Um, how do you use data? Like, how do we address this issue that kind of you've brought up and Jacob's brought up as well? And thank you so much for sharing as well, Jacob. How do you kind of correct this via something like a social media platform or via, you know, communications when you're trying to communicate a social issue as complex as gender-based violence. Mm, yeah. Well, th thanks for thanks for the love. That's very sweet. Um, you know, I think to be honest, I, I really made a conscious effort around that space of communication from a very early stage when I started the organisation. So I'm a researcher by background, and I'm a total data nerd. And I had worked for the UN and lots of other large-scale research projects. And when I founded the Equality Institute. You know, a big part of it was a realization that, you know, to be honest, researchers are pretty terrible at communicating to the general public. We're great at communicating to other academics in academic journals that someone reads, but we're pretty terrible at communicating in other ways that actually reach policymakers. Or and so the first, you know, one of my first hires was a visual designer, and everyone thought I was crazy. I was starting a research organization, hiring a graphic designer. And um, but it was probably the best decision I ever made because really we focused from the beginning on how do we communicate in a way that actually reaches people. It actually reaches policymakers to change decision, decisions. It reaches community to kind of um, you know inspire and influence people. And I think for us it's that combination of of statistics and stories. You know, because you can hear the statistic that like 2 million Australian adults have experienced sexual assault since the age of 15. And that number is actually really a compilation of individual experiences and trauma. And if you just think about the number um, and you don't realise and connect that to the fact that these are people's stories, then it can seem meaningless. These big numbers can seem meaningless. So I think we try and, I guess, meet people where they are and speak in ways that they can understand and recognise that we have to communicate. The way I would communicate to a policymaker is going to be different to the way I might communicate to, you know, a young feminist activist. And but to really try and think about who we're talking to and, and speak in the languages and the ways that, that they can understand. Because that's our, our job is to try and translate these complex issues. And if we can't do it, then we're, we're failing, I think. Mm. Yeah. And look, I, I just think on that, I think some of the times that the definitions that people, there are sometimes really simple solutions that, you know, we just have to step back and think, why, like, I find it very hard to understand is in, in transport that we don't recognize, like sexual harassment I find actually very disturbing, but we don't consider it an assault. So uh, a taxi driver can ask me to have sexual intercourse with him and it is not a crime. It doesn't count as, you know, he could proposition my 18-year-old daughter, my 14-year-old daughter. Now, that's not a criminal offence and that could happen for the entire trip. There is nothing 
against the law about that. Now, as soon as he were to touch his passenger, that becomes an assault. And so, you know, there are these bizarre gaps in our understanding of what safety means. And I think it's, it's a very unsafe thing to ask anybody who is in your, you know, you're working for to have sex with you. Um, I go about every day without asking anyone for sex. Um, and it's quite doable. You know, I did it all day today, all day. Didn't ask anyone for sex, managed it. Big tip for me, dear diary, another day done. Didn't ask anyone for sex. It's quite well done, George. Thanks, I'm pretty proud. Did it yesterday, probably will get it done tomorrow as well. And so I, I just find it extraordinary that there are lawmakers, policymakers, data collectors who seem to go, oh, we couldn't possibly ask, ask that of our drivers, what that they don't proposition the people in their cars who are, who are, you know, they might be in a wheelchair, they might not be, they might be drunk, they might be old, they might be children. They, but either way, they're your customers and much like if you're a physiotherapist and somebody's on your table or you're their GP or they're your school teacher or they're your, you know, there are sorts of codes of conduct that shouldn't be breached. Um, and, okay, you may not have much success passenger to passenger on a train, but certainly in very closed, um, you know, sort of like very fast-moving toilets really if you think about taxis um, or ubers or anything else we could very easily say it's a criminal offense to proposition a passenger um, and therefore it could become a charge which could therefore see that driver then removed from the platform instead of keeping it as a civil offense like it's happening in an office or something else which is again you know <laughs> If it, you could still make that a crime, like why do we keep it as a civil matter um, mm. instead of a criminal matter? Like it's it's an absurdity to me that we act as though we we keep that. It's just a stroke of a pen. Mm. Um, we act as though that's something that just happens between people, and we can't make that adjustment. So. You know, there are very, I keep annoying everybody at every conference I go to, you know. Um, I don't just flick them on the earlobe, which would be kind of fun. I actually keep raising this issue and saying, why can't we get a database of drivers who sexually harass their passengers um, and, you know, remove them from ever driving again so they can't just hop from one platform to another and gather that data, like not just the ones who commit a criminal offence, but chat up, make uncomfortable, ask people if they're married, if they've got a boyfriend, tell them they're hot, like just set out a clear bunch of comments that we just know are professionally um, not appropriate. Mm. We can do it for everyone else in the workforce. Why not? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's why we're here. Anyone have any ideas? Um, oh. I would love to hear from the panel about how they think that data can be used better in the work that they do um, to um, address social inequities and how that might apply to a transport setting. Um, I, I've really got something just, just, just brief to pop in there. And is, and I, I think data is, is a really powerful tool to you can't address what you do not know and if we don't have the complexity and the nuance of that data then it doesn't actually you know uh, give us a bigger picture and women with disabilities tend to get thrown into all people with disabilities in general we're thrown into one great big cohort my experience in a wheelchair is different to somebody who uses different mobility aids or who has chronic illness um, and has chronic pain um, psychosocial disability intellectual disability and, and, and as far as I know, we don't, we're not, you know, you disseminate, like you're really pulling apart those demographics when we're looking at the experiences of, you know, being out in public and public transport for disabled people. You know, we're not one homogenous cohort of people. Yeah. We are non-binary, we're called, we're Indigenous, we're, you know, we've got so, and we're trans and we've got so many different diversities that sit with our disability as long as have, as well as having diverse disabilities. And, 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 and what are the differences between all of those? So we can start to really look at addressing all the intersecting problems for 
multiple different cohorts within disability as well. But also, you know, using this data and actually starting to talk to people and, and understanding the experience of women with disabilities, like who, who may have had a lifetime of disempowering experiences. So when the taxi driver says, can I sleep with you? It's like, there will be women that will be so uncomfortable to say no because they've never been allowed to say no in their mm. lives. I'm one of those women that turns into, I'm a very outspoken woman and I'm quite feisty, but believe it or not, there are situations around ableism where I revert to completely passive mm. and I will just smile and nod and yes and, and go along with what is happening. And that is something that has been conditioned into me over years and years of disempowering experience experiences we need to really be asking mm. in what settings have you reverted to that or have you felt you couldn't speak up when you normally would and unpacking that we need that information to really understand you know what are those settings that are creating those um you know moments for people with disabilities knowing that they happen for you know especially for women with disabilities that instant passive mode is something that happens for us and if we can't understand the gravity and the, and the scope of that we need the data on that to know just how extensive in what spaces um you know and what situations to, to to have plans of attack in how to you know address it and approach it data gives us power but data is only one thing that data has to then also connect with that lived experience so you're marrying up that objective and subjective knowledge to really understand a problem so that we can start problem solving and then designing that solution from both of those lenses of the subjective objective knowledge together. To, and, and this is like the stuff like Joanne and I have done some really cool stuff and this is the stuff that she's fantastic at. And, 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 and that's our way forward mm. is that co not just tokenistic co-design, it's that really bringing the lived experience in there, collecting the data, nuanced data to speak to that lived experience and then doing proper embedded work to really look at how are we going to address this? What are we going to do to move forward? And, 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 and there's spaces that do it and then there's the government will to continue to do it and it's getting there. I think definitely in Victoria, it is getting there. Victoria, Other states yeah. maybe not. Yeah, other yeah. states maybe so I'm not, um, but it's moving in that right direction. And I guess it's that you're know, just pushing it that bit further. And I was listening to that stuff around data feminism and, you know, even just looking at disability, like I said, the NDIS has no gender lens. The NDIS has no plan of approach to why are we not bringing women into the scheme at the same rates as men? How, what are we missing? And there's no attempt to even look at any of that. Yeah, that is an example of bias in data, like for me yeah. within, you know, the disability cohort. Yep. hundred percent. So many good points. Data absolutely is power. And I think it's really interesting that when we talk about data, we often think of, we usually think of quantitative data and we usually think of these like big spreadsheets. Um, and really I want to actually ask Joanne, and we've got a question um, as well in the Q and A for Joanne. I, I, I feel really passionately about qualitative data. And I feel that, you know, our stories haven't been traditionally heard or believed and we continue to face that, um, that, yeah, lack of belief in our stories. We've seen that in the media this whole year. Um, we live it every day. Um, and I am very passionate about, you know, turning lived experience, those stories that anecdotally we always share into data. The vision for She's a Crowd has always been. So I really want to ask Joanne for your expertise. We have a question here. Um, I would love to hear Joanne share some of the co-design methods that you use. Um, and any case studies that you might have asking as a baby service designer. <laughs> Thank you uh, for, for the question. I mean, firstly, I want to say co-design is, is a great method, but it, it's only a great method when we are able to 
um, have that diversity of perspective. So it's really easy for it to be a very privileged process. And we have to work really hard every day to think about firstly, do I have, to, do I have the right to co-design in this space? This space, I'm a white privileged woman, right? Is it my job to do that? And then who is, it, who is it that we're asking to participate? Whose voices are we hearing? And whose voices are we not hearing? Like that's the most important part because think about who is, who is it that can easily walk into a room or join a Zoom as we do in this COVID world and participate in some form of co-design. Right? There are lots of people where there are a lot of barriers in being able to participate. So we need to think about how is it we can take co-design to the community and make it much more accessible for people. And then how do we facilitate that with people from the community that they have really close relationships with? Um, we've just finished an amazing piece of work with ABC International, um, working with young women in Vanuatu and Tonga about cyber safety. And so what we did in that context is we actually worked with in-country facilitators, um, wonderful, talented, young feminist women, and they facilitated those co-design workshops with their peers they knew what activities were going to work and be safe for those uh, young women. Um, they knew kind of how to design the workshops in a culturally appropriate way. So we, we sat in the background. So we helped them, we taught them about co-design, we helped them to design activities, but it was, it was a process in facilitation of kind of co-designing the co-design before we went and spoke with those young women. It was a much richer process because we understood that um, we have an enormous bias. And I can't stand in the shoes of a young woman um, in the Pacific who is in a very different um, environment, in a very different cultural context, you know, what she has access to in terms of technology, um, you know, what the relationships are in gender in those communities is different to my experience. And so if I go into that community and try to co-design, I'm going to bring all of that bias and privilege along with me. So I think it's it's really important to know who, who we should entrust for the co-design to ensure that people can share their lived experience in really safe ways, but also that it's an empowering experience um, for people. And then we're not, we're not going into communities and just extracting their data from them so that we can then go away and use that data for our own purposes. But it's actually a collaborative process where people feel like they're coming together as a community, sharing stories and developing solutions together. We're not designing for people where we're designing with them. It's great. It sounds like at least one of the solutions to some of the issues we've been discussing tonight. Um, and I know that Jacob and Emma both have a lot of experience um, working in a variety of different communities all around the world. Um, I'd love to hear more about how you've perhaps used data or lived experience or co-design or any of these things um, to make transport and cities safer? <laughs> you start, you start, Jacob. Okay, I'll go, I'll go. We're very polite, I love oh, that. It's nice. Thank you. Um, well, look, I mean, you know, this kind of touches on a few um, previous points that we've discussed as well, so I'll try and sort of bring all of it in. Um, I mean, you know, from what I'm con consciously minded about is you know well I guess like you know how the systems that sit around data to begin with I mean like you know Emma's kind of touched on this um you know Joanne's definitely touched on it Nick's touched on it George's touched on it Zoe's touched on it jo Zoe's doing a PhD in it but you know it's just <laughs> let's be real but it's like you know it's um I mean and we're kind of like not to shade my fellow panelists but you know we can't, we can't we've kind of still been speaking in a binary term about gender you know, through a lot of this and, you know, um, a lot of my work has been in international development and getting people over the line, not just with me being non-binary and the legal protections that I need to, you know, fly into an airport, um, but also that recognising that that's a very different, like that is a Western term, you know, and that is a personal term for me. Um, you know, it's, you've just got to be, like, you've got to do your homework. That's it. And, I th and one of the things I wanted to raise earlier is that um, I, find it, I find it interesting is that we're kind of very much in this, so like we're very much in like an anti-science space at the moment, right? And data is science. It's what it is. It, mm. it is useful points of information that help to tell a story. And 
as someone who is an academic and a researcher and, you know, Emma, feel free to <laughs> check me on this if I'm incorrect, but the amount of rigour that we have to go through in our experiments, in our theories, the peer review to get everything published. And just for context, like my research is building the world's first ever health intervention roadmap for queer kids that is co-designed with them and informed by them. That's never existed before. The, um, and that's a global analysis. I got seven years to do it. I'm six months in. I'm having a great time. It's fine. Um, <laughs> this is a wig. No, it's fine. But um, <laughs> my wigs don't look this good. But it's, you know, the amount of rigor that we have to go through. And then that science is then not trusted. I mean, COVID's a great example. <laughs> How fun, not going to go down the rabbit hole. But, you know, when businesses or when policymakers or legislators are proposing these points, to George's point earlier, they don't have to go through that level of rigour. And we do. And I think that that's, I'm going to call BS, to be quite mm. frank. And this is not to point out any particular government, or, but, you know, I'm paying attention to the q and I'm seeing some of the comments that are kind of coming through from people. It's right to be suspicious. It is absolutely right to be suspicious around any design, not just in transport and safety, but your but any business that you build should be grounded in safety. It should be grounded in the ethics and the rigor of the basic human rights provision of safety. That should be it. Mm. Done. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you are building a system and everything that sits around us is a system, economy is a system, healthcare is a system all the tech stuff is systems, all this educational stuff, they're all systems that we as humans built, right? <laughs> We've got it. Uh, that's, I mean, that's not an opinion. That's just a historical fact. Mm. Like we didn't just pop up one day and we were just like money mm. or oh, how fun or oh, here's a 20. Like, you know, we've built these things, right? My socialism is coming out. <laughs> that's just, <laughs> but you know, it's like you have to be mindful of when you build something else that, what you had learnt it being just a, a flesh sack with consciousness, it's like a sponge taking things in. Um, of course, you're going to repeat that. Of course, you're going to repeat that same systemic build. You're going to build the same kind of system, especially if it's, it's, it's biased, it's inherent, it's just there. You just have it and that's what it is. But you have to catch yourself on it. You have to do the work. You have to put the effort in. You have to, like, care is an action. You just have to put the work in. Just finally... It's kind of like when people say that they're allies, right? And like, I'm sure everyone on this call is probably an ally. That's great. We love that. Good. You probably, if not, if not a raging queer of sexuals, and I love that for our community. So super cute. Um, but you know, you don't get to just pick if you're an ally today. You know, I'll tell you if you're an ally, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, like yeah. women will tell you if they feel safe. Queers will tell you if we feel safe. Yeah. You know. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you <laughs> you don't just get to assume that because you scraped over the low bar of not being bad <laughs> that you are automatically brilliant all right yeah. and that goes for any of us so you've got to put the effort in it's just what it is otherwise it's it might be an incredibly rich venture you might be you might be flying into space instead of supporting climate action <laughs> but <laughs> you're still garbage and it's still a garbage project so just put the effort in please yeah I think it's important like to remind everyone that what we're talking about this evening, we're talking about getting from A to B safely. It's a right. Every single person has the right to move around safely. Um, yeah, unless we're in a hectic COVID lockdown, we have to move around. So um, this is what we're talking about. Emma, did you want to add anything to what Jacob was saying? Uh, I mean, J Jacob's covered it. Perfectly. And I think Joanna as well said, you know, a lot of great things around the way we, I mean, I think, you know, how we have to think about the ways that we collect data um, in, in ways that are collaborative and ethical and safe. And um, I guess the only thing I would add is for us to think about, you know, a lot of what we're talking about today is around um, these individual experiences that we have and um, like you said so we're getting from A to B and there's a lot that we can do better to kind of improve those experiences I always like us to think about and step back one bit further when we think about prevention um, and we have to think about 
what are the underpinning systems that exist within our society that enable, enable this to happen? So we can, you know, put in more lighting and we can have, um, you know, the wonderful work that Shiva does. But why, why does this even happen in the first place? Why is there sexual assault and abuse and harassment of, in the first place? And it's because of systems of oppression. It's because of bigotry and discrimination. And so while we're kind of doing the work to improve the experiences at an individual level, we also have to be working at a societal and cultural level to address homophobia and racism and sexism and ableism. Because unless we do that, we're going to keep sort of putting a band-aid on this problem. And that's the hard work and it's, there's no easy solution and it's going to take a long time, but I feel like we have to do both at the same time. Yeah, and I, I, just to add to that, Emma, I think, you know, when we, we measure very happily, like you can sit down, and this might sound a bit men bashy, but I, I'm, I don't care. Um, <laughs> you know, you can sit down with guys and they can tell you how many times someone with a left hand bowled from the southern end of the MCG. Like they will measure things they care about so happily and trail, you know, and reel it off as an excuse for a conversation at the drop of a hat. Like they will, you know, I'm sorry, it's just the truth. I have been that bored. Red for filth, George. Red for <laughs> filth. Sorry. sorry, keep going. <laughs> it's true. So people will measure what they care about and they will find a reason to not measure about what they're indifferent about or what serves them. And so... You know, it's. I see women like us, and 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 you know, people like us all the time, who actually are suffering with you know the neck of pat, the foot of patriarchy on our throats, um, trying to collate and demonstrate, and you know, it, it infuriates me. I won't stop doing it, but um, you know, if if the system under which you live is currently not throwing up any problems for you, you're not going to give it up without a struggle. So, yes, we need the quality, we need the quantity, we need the anecdotes, um, but we need to, it's, it's going to be a fight to demonstrate that this system is unjust, it's unethical, it's not productive, and ultimately it doesn't make as much money for them if people aren't fully functional, they can't get to work, um, they can't, you know, women being out of the workforce because they can't get their kids to and from childcare because there isn't actually a train if you can't get people who are otherwise employable because their wheelchair doesn't make, can't get onto the train station. You know, you, if you have to appeal to an economic argument because you can't actually appeal to an ethical argument because the people in power don't seem to have those, um, you know, if non-binary people or the queer community is unsafe and can't safely make their way to and from their homes um, or to and from their workplaces or go and enjoy the arts festival or whatever it might be, that's actually bad for, you know, the entire community. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we'll do the measuring because uh, it seems to be that sometimes the only arguments you can make are economic arguments and that does need a hard and fast mm. data analysis, unfortunately, because they know the stories of the suffering. I mean, look at this year, heavens to Betsy. Um, anyway, I've left that on a real downer, bummer note. No, anyway. no, it's okay. <laughs> I, I um. I have so much to say, George. I really want to move on, though, to oh. some of the questions um, from the audience. Oh. So, oh, I, yeah, yeah. Right. So, there's one particular, um, there's one particular question slash experience, I guess. Um, here from Rachel, who says, "In trams, it feels that you're on your own, even if it's full." Other passengers don't get involved. I've had bystander training, so I often choose to sit next to women who, a woman who seems vulnerable. Sometimes I intervene if I feel I can, but I'm a white cis het woman, so it's easier for me. It's 
really hard to seek help in a situation where asking for help makes you more vulnerable. If you call the police from your mobile on a tram, you're making yourself a target. I have had drivers ignore me when I've asked for help. My teenage daughter has experienced the same problem and she had a man masturbating opposite her and her safety plan was just to get off the tram. Running trams with only one person in control uh, leaves all of us vulnerable. So the question is how can those who are in charge of our public transport better protect us while we use public transport? Well, I mean, we've, we've had an argument to bring back conductors for ages and I, I think you just have to keep writing to the Department of Transport. I mean, yeah, that's a really big problem. You could take a photo of him and report it to the police. I, I think there's a real big thing. We've 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 got this conversation around, you know, the bystander intervention. You know, if you see something, say something, step up, all that kind of stuff. But for a lot of people in the community, it's it's how do you do that safely? And we're not yeah. getting out that message. There needs to be an education piece around because they're uh, like my my partner is he's a quiet man, he's a passive man, he doesn't like confrontation, and he's like, well, how do I step in safely without aggravating this bloke and 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 it's 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 not enough to just say yes, yeah, step up and step in, but actually giving people tools and resources of how to step in that is going to keep you safe, the person you're trying to step in for safe mm. as well. Mm. Um, and we're not giving that information. We're just saying you're not doing something. You need to do something. But we're not actually going to tell you how. It's like you know, men need to step up, but. Well, what do we mean by that? And what are those steps of stepping up? It's not enough to tell people and say the right words. We need to give people some tangible things where they can go, all right, okay, so this is what I need to do. And that's a safe way to approach this. And I can step in and I feel you know, more comfortable about doing that. Because, you know, people do step in and they do end up putting themselves in danger. And, and that, again, is not okay. Okay. No, I had a friend that got yeah. a head, head injury and has has yeah. got a major head in head disability. You know, is, will never be okay. You know, he yeah. stepped in, and I mean, it's a yeah. really, really serious thing to be doing. Yeah, um, it is, and it's a serious person. thing to be asking people to do. And we need to really? be looking at you know um, campaigns that actually give people tools or ideas of how to do that and how to do it safely. So. Some education, you know, more than just if you see something, say something, step in, don't be a bystander. It's it, it, it's it's good. It's not nowhere near good enough no. to deal with yeah. what some of the things we're confronted with. And and also if you've got somebody there that is in the middle of drug psychosis and, and it, we're, we're not equipped as individuals, as we're not mental health professionals in how to step in in those spaces. How do we keep the person who's in a psychosis space you know, safe while keeping ourselves safe? It's just, it's more than just do something. And, and that's what frustrates me with a lot of campaigns. And that's what frustrates me with a lot of messages. Is there's no behind the scenes work there. And, and to do this properly, we need investment. We need training. We need to um, you know, research you know, what are the safe methods for somebody when there's no one around, um, around you know, sort of stepping in and being safe. Yeah, someone in the chat has actually asked you, Nicole, um, yeah. where have you seen safety done well um, or had experiences with services that have created a sense of safety? Um, <laughs> um, when I've been out and about, not so... Yeah, not so much. Um, one incident where I locked myself in a toilet at a train station and called the police and they did manage to find me and I waited till they got there and they kept on the phone to me until they did find me and, and um, you know, made sure the person that I was having problems with had been removed from the station and escorted me to the train line and, and made sure that other person had got on a train going in the other direction. Um, so that's that is one incident, but like I had to lock myself in a filthy, dirty toilet and I'm calling someone and just hoping something would happen. And I thought, maybe you're going to stay, stay here for a few hours, you'll bugger off. Um, but other things where I did have an incident in a taxi and, and I ended up, um, and it kept wanting to go in the wrong direction. And I kept saying, that's, you know, you're going out to the Western suburbs, I'm in the outer Northern suburbs. 
you don't go that way and you wouldn't listen. So I live tweeted. I've just tweeted people and people interacted with me. Um, and, and the Taxi Services Commissioner in Victoria picked up on that and they brought me in to, um, you know, consult on, um, you know, sort of their, their, their plans around accessibility and, and taxis and disability. So yeah, they do listen. And if you do chuck it on Twitter and you tag them, or even if you don't tag them, um, it does get back to them. It feels like they do seem to want to do something and they are listening. And I'm not the only one where they've, you know, they've seen that thing on that stuff on Twitter and they have brought people in to have a really decent, thorough conversation around what do you think would have worked for you in that situation? How do you think we can do better? Here, so. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so you, I guess they're the incidents where things are, you know, you know, have been done well. Mm. Um, yeah, or bystanders have could come and sort of stood in, but they haven't been in very intense situations. And I, and I think when you know, things are really heated, that's a very very different situation it's easy to step in when things are kind of minor yep thanks Nicole sorry I just had to jump away for a sec uh, um, to get my airpods because my computer just decided to listen to to go out into those instead um so I've got another um question here for everybody and I know that we're running out of time now so um I might just ask the whole panel how do you believe um that data is important for moving forward with the feminist movement and how can we um, share this message to build the data that will lead to change? I, I would ask specifically in the transport sector. Do you want to go first? I can jump in quickly. I've got something I've been on my mind. Making sure that whatever you know data we're looking at and, and, and implementing anything is is, is not coming from a utilitarian approach. So not the greatest good for the most amount of people. And like, um, you know, uh, Jacob was saying before around, you know, safety for everyone and, and, and looking at the problem and looking at the data and, 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 and how do we tackle transport and, and, and some of the stuff they said in the, in, you know, with, with data feminism is, is working from the margins and working your way in. When we're looking at safety, how are we keeping people in the margins safe? making our way in you know, in, you know this is the social worker coming out in me deploying that you know that critical feminist lens to what we're doing versus a utilitarian lens which seems to be a very easy go-to because you know, we're getting bang for our buck but the people on the margins are the ones that get left out of that equation and it's just simply not good enough yeah i'd, I'd add to that um also thinking about what experiences are people avoiding uh, so we can look at data about what is the experience that you have in transport settings, but often the work that we do is asking people what their workarounds are because the options are not safe to them. And so when you look at avoidance, um, that helps you to understand, I guess, um, that there's an experience there that's not suitable for somebody and so they're taking a different option and that also tells us something. Um, I would say along what Joanne's saying, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that people don't do and people don't ask, you know, what, what people are avoiding. And I, I get terrified about, <clears throat> a lot of people talk about, you know, the AI and, you know, in the tech world that I have found myself in bizarrely enough, um, you know, these driverless vehicles as being the answer and that really just doesn't account, like the world being designed by a 27-year-old boy in a hoodie, um, thinking that everyone lives the world like him. And, you know, it just doesn't account for older people, children, you know, even anyone who's got asthma or epilepsy or, you know, it, it just doesn't work for anyone who's even, you know, on crutches for a couple of weeks. And that really, it, there's so much talk all the time about driverless vehicles and it, it just doesn't suit so much of the population, but it's what everyone gets really, you know, turned on by. And it, for me, it's just a heart sinking notion. And it really shows me the sort of Silicon Valley skew towards white male youth supremacy um, that is so, you know, again, that I just haven't thought about, oh, all of those people who aren't us, um, oh, that's right, women, uh, children, people over 60 people who you know might need a medication or have an allergy you know it just doesn't occur to them so yeah the other people mm. so yeah 
I'd love to get mm. more data about them. Great. Would anyone else like to put their two cents in about that? I, I mean, I think the messages have been spot on. I think the only yeah. thing I would add is that, you know, building on what Nicole said around, you know, going from the margins in and and that when we think about that, that's involved at all all stages. So it's not just like consultation at the, you know, at a certain point that it's all the way from, you know, design, planning, policy, solutions, implementation, that we're at the table when all of that is happening, not just mm -hmm. being consulted and that there's a focus on those, whose voices have historically been ignored. Mm. Mm -hmm. What was the question again? Oh, so. the question was, uh, how do you believe data is important for moving forward with the feminist movements? Um, and how can we share this message so we can build data that will lead to change? And I think specifically, I would love to hear like um, how this would apply um, in transport and safety. Yeah. Um, clearly, I was paying too much attention to my mm -hmm. wonderful co-panelists. Um, I was just like, I agree. That's great. I don't know. I can't remember what we're talking about, but more. <laughs> yes. Love this. Great. Take me back to my theatre director days. I'm just like, I don't know which scene we're up to, but it's lovely. Anyway, <laughs> there's a reason I'm not in that career. Um, <laughs> but look, I think there's, um, uh, look, you, you're going to have to, okay, as a creative person, you know, if I want to engineer something, if I want to build a new outfit, right, I can't just go from these are pants and pants will make a hat, right? <laughs> I can't, I can't engineer to that. Like, it's just, it's just not going to work. So I think if we're looking for like, if we look, if we want to be sincere about this, we have to kind of scratch what we've built already to start with a blank slate because at the moment you know I yeah and as a person with a psychosocial disability but not a physical one apologies I don't want to overstep my space here so Nick catch me if I'm being an asshole <laughs> um <laughs> but um you know it's we but the narrative around you know Melbourne's tram system for example when yeah, you know, there was that the uproar of able-bodied people who were just sort of like oh, I can't believe that, like, you know, they're putting, you know, all this road work, all this development. Oh, the tram stops look ugly, blah, 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 blah. It's just like, well, I mean, one, bugger off. Or just get into buggery. Buggery is very good and I'm great at it, so there's that. But, you know, <laughs> it's illegal in 71 countries. Work on that. <laughs> anyway, but um, <laughs> we should give a crap about that too. But it's like, well, if you kind of designed from the start... <laughs> that that was going to need to happen, you probably wouldn't have these little eyesore situations that are necessary and too few and not well done, <laughs> to be quite fair. Um, it, that probably wouldn't be the case. Like you've got to, like it, you're trying to make a hat out of pants. I yeah. need people to just go all the way back. And this is what I have to do in health implementation design. This is what I have to do in international development. This is what I do in anything. I don't just try and re-engineer from what's already there. I just sort of go, okay, well, that clearly doesn't work well. What would work well? You know, and you have to take all of that into account. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to be scientific about it, that's totally fine. But like, just listen to your mates then. <laughs> like, just don't be arrogant. They're just yeah. great <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, you need, what makes a great... Um, what makes a great academic, great researcher, a great designer, a great creative, a great friend is checking, is not trying to fix things that you know, you're given immediately. You just take it mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. You take it on. You think about it. You stew on it. You start to sort of say, oh, that's happening over here. Like, who else could this be happening to? Let's work on this. You know, you work on the similarities. You work on sort of saying, okay, well, that's, you know, big, big, big moments of similarity right there. And then there's all these individual circumstances that sit outside of here, still relevant, still valid. Mm. Every, every single narrative, every bit of data is important. Yeah. You can't be convenient with data because people are not mm. convenient. That's, that's right. 
I think that that is a great note to end on. You are Listen to your to mates you. <laughs> and some great personal advice there too that I'm, I myself is going to take away. Um, and I think that's right, 100% data is not necessarily convenient, um, but we do need to sit with it sometimes and, and really listen. So I just want to finish up by saying a huge thank you to everybody for coming. Um, thank you for participating in the chat. Thank you for asking so many questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get through all of them. A massive thank you to our amazing panel. I have enjoyed this discussion so much um, and to Portable and especially to my team at She's a Crowd who've been working so hard uh, towards this event. It was supposed to be in person. Obviously it couldn't be. We've shuffled around and, you know, and I just i am so grateful to the whole team at She's a Crowd as well. The helplines are in the chat and the support services are in the chat if you need them. Um, and if you feel ready, please head over to She's a Crowd and share your story. Um, we would love to hear your story and we would love to have more data about this issue um, so that we can make cities and transport safer for everybody into the future. Um, so thanks everybody. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening.